uh, is where you're going to uh, get some tips about the forms and fields that you're on and the form actions. Um, I recommend uh, using um, the uh, actions that are on the left side there versus trying to close um, from the upper right hand corner of the of the uh, display. You, as you become accustomed to these form actions, you're, they're they're very common throughout the tool. Um, in order to uh, start a new client, you just click on New, and it's going to open up the client details. You can always tell where you are by uh, the the title at the top, and also um, underneath here of the navigation bar, uh, it shows client details. And I'm going to put in a new client, and it's called a new uh, cellular client. Now I can add lots of other information. We do integrate with Outlook, and I could drag and drop um, a client contact onto here, and it would populate everything for me. Um, I'm not going to bore you with typing in all of these fields. Notice that as I navigate through the fields over on the form details, it does uh, give you some information about you know what to put in those fields. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. But basically, to add a new client, you just t type in and then click Save. And so we now have a, a client record added. Now, that is going to be true with the process you just saw. It's going to be true for adding locations, um, adding new suppliers, adding new accounts. Uh, lots of things are going to be basically that simple. Um, but there's a lot of additional information. And of course, the more information you put in, the more useful it's going to be downstream. We don't gather information just for the sake of, of, of uh, practicing our typing skills. Um, we, this information is used on form letters, and reports, uh, change requests, or whatever. So uh, clearly, you'll want to um, populate the information thoroughly. But I, again, I don't want to take the time to go through and populate all these fields. Um, now, I do want to uh, sh show you one thing about help, because I think it will give you a feel for where we're going. Notice when I open up help, um, it will take me to the help screen. Uh, section of help that pertains to the form that I'm currently residing on. So it tries to get you as close as possible to where you, you might need some help. Um, we, we tried to make help helpful. I know it's a kind of a rare concept, but uh, I thought that that would be a good idea. Um, but under the overview, and this is something I've already guided a few of you to, uh, to look at, under this overview, there's this kind of general concept, because it's not a spreadsheet. Um, and it's not a Word document, you know, it's, it's a, a relational database. And uh, this general concept will help you understand that there's only a handful of areas that you need to focus on. It may seem like a lot more than, than six or seven forms, but uh, there really are these, these key areas. And um, aside from these relationships, there's this thing that we have down here called the, the living baseline. And, and one of the powerful elements of the tool set is to be able to keep track of what were your baseline plans and rates, when did you make changes to services, and how long are you going to bill for, what's the percentage that you're billing for, is it 24 months, is it 36 months, is it a 50% split, a 60-40 split, or whatever. Because not all these changes occur all at the same time. So um, the transaction uh, records that get created in TAMS will allow for the automatic management of when to start and stop billing for things. So these two ideas of this relational model up here and this living baseline is, is worth reading. I'm going to focus on just these three gray bubbles uh, and the managed line services. And these three circles represent um, uh, three uh, kind of spaces where you have a client space, and each client can have multiple locations. There's no limit there. And each uh, location can have multiple lines. We do tie cellular devices to locations for shipping purposes if you're shipping out equipment. One of the things I tried to allude to uh, down in Arizona that I didn't get a lot of time uh, to, to go into but uh, wanted to illustrate that this information, the data, informational database, um, can uh, be applied in many with many different business models, whether it be um, contingency cost savings, which is kind of a core service, but also things like um, uh, managed services, 
<coughs> project services, <coughs> TEM, uh, you know, like invoice processing and, and budgeting. So this data is, is useful in many different uh, dimensions. So we uh, have this client model that uh, we already added a, a client record. And within a client, we're going to have locations and lines. And I'm going to show you that. And then we have a supplier uh, uh, side of uh, the um, tool so that you can maintain a list of suppliers and their plans. And that's where most of the manual labor comes in, into play. And those plans define all of the pricing parameters uh, of their um, services. So whether it be long distance, toll free, data services, local, cellular data, cellular voice, it, those are where all the plans are uh, stored, all their pricing information. And then the, this intermediate is the relationship between the client and their supplier, and those are the service accounts that they get billed for each month. And then there's this concept of sub-accounts, and actually with cellular, it's very easy to start with sub-accounts with cellular because they represent share pools. So um, a sub-account is equivalent to a share pool in the, um, in the uh, cellular world. Um, now, once we have these prerequisites of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items in place, then we are able to create these relationships through a, a form called managed line services. And that will create the this, this service history, which is those transaction records, which will, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see what those mean. So just keep this little bubble chart in mind as we go, because what I'm going to do is show you how to create these, these seven bubbles and then put them together. So we already did the client. By default, when you add a new client, you also, by default, get a client location. Now, had I filled in the address information here, it would have been echoed down into this client location. And I can uh, add a new location, as many locations as I want. I can just go to the client location details form and click on new location. Or I can be at the level above it. It's a hierarchical structure. I could just add a location by clicking this add location button. And I'll just call this, you know, VZ. And locations can be physical entities, like physical addresses, or they can be just an organizational, like a placeholder where you want to store some information. So um, I'm going to put um, something like Verizon Wireless cell phones on here and save it. So now I have two locations. And again, um, on a physical location, I'm going to have an address. I may have a site contact. I'm going to have equipment records for their PBX. I can have uh, interconnect contact information. And again, um, I can drag and drop um, contact information from, uh, from Outlook contacts to populate this information if I have that available to me. All right. So we now have two of those seven bubbles. That's the client and the client location. The next thing we need is uh, some inventory, and that can be landlines or cellular. I'm going to do cellular, but what you see for cellular is going to be directly relatable for landlines. So I can add cell devices a couple of different ways. I can, since I don't have any to, to start with, I can just click the Add Cell Devices button. It brings me down another layer into the tool of this hierarchy, and it says, um, okay, we can um, start typing in phone numbers and usernames and all, but I hate typing. I'm a terrible typist. And I want to do this as quickly as possible. So um, we're not going to manually enter information. Instead, I'm going to click under the form actions, the stop adding. And now I have activated this import device records. Now, this is where I'm going to um, uh, switch over to a, a Windows Explorer um, form where I have downloaded a device report from Verizon Wireless website. And we actually have a script for the device report. Um, and it will convert the, the information from the, the Verizon Wireless download file into an importable format that's a common delimited file. Um, it takes um, a, a matter of seconds to uh, run the report. I'm just going to demonstrate that. I'm not going to do this all day long for you. But I, I, some of you may or may not have seen this. And um, it's a very simple thing. In fact, this is something that I can have a, a person that's been working for me for about one day do this. Um, basically, they take the input file. They double-click this icon. They put in the input file name, give it an output file name, click OK. It runs, tells me that 199 records were written. And um, 
here is what the results look like. It's just a common delimited file, and it has information in it, you know, phone numbers and usernames and ESN numbers and makes and models and cost centers and contract start dates and end dates. Okay, now I can import all 199, but I don't want to overwhelm you with 199 records. So um, that is um, what we can get from a device report, and we have scripts for, you know, AT&T Wireless and TELUS and, uh, um, you know, um, T-Mobile, you know, Bell, Bell Canada, whatever. Um, and we also have them on the landline side. Um, now, there may be new scripts needed for new carriers or something has changed on their reports and we need to maintain the script, and that's something we centralize and we can talk about that at another time. Um, we can also extract information directly from the invoice. So here's a copy of an invoice that's uh, very small, 82 pages. It's one sub-account of many sub-accounts with this client, and it has a group of phones. And we have a different script that we can run on the invoice, because the invoice has the information that's different, like usages and costs and all, that's different than the device report. So in order to run the device report, again, I can uh, just take the uh, a script and I can extract uh, the phone numbers right out of the um, invoice, and it uses the PDF as an import as a it, as the input file, and then it runs and gives me a result that says, "Oh, I pulled out eight records." Now, this import file, we we provide these scripts and maintain them. Now, okay. these scripts are not available. Yeah, well, okay, so in our hosted environment, they're automatically available. During the trial period, these scripts are not available. You'll have to send us uh, an invoice to have us script it for you. It only takes, like you said, you see here, it only takes a few seconds. Um, but those scripts are, are not public domain scripts, so they're, they're not for redistribution, and they're not available until you become licensed, okay? But um, once you're licensed, you have access to them, and if you're hosted, they're already on our hosted environment. Okay. So um, these scripts uh, will pull out information that's available. Obviously, they may not have some of the information, uh, like contract end dates from an invoice, but they do have some things like what kind of plans these phones are on, and this is going to be very useful to us, so I'm going to show you that. Um, and, and I don't want to uh, necessarily go through and run all of these because uh, you're, you're not going to learn anything from it. But um, so for now, uh, during your trial, if you have an invoice that you're working with, send us the invoice. We'll run the script, send you back the results. Okay. So I, I, I run this script. I pulled out some usage and some phone numbers. And the usage, of course, is important because that's dynamic. It changes every month. You know, and, and these scripts pull out, you can see there's peak usage, off-peak usage, mobile-to-mobile -mobile usage, there's data usage, there's messaging usage, there uh, can be um, uh, text messaging, picture messaging, uh, roaming, and also it pulls out what the total cost is of each of the devices. So, you know, there's like, I don't know, 50 different data points per device that you don't want to, uh, on 199 cell phones, you don't want to be manually entering that data going through a PDF or whatever and trying to extract that manually. So the scripts, clearly that technology makes uh, the, the, your productivity much, much greater than it would be otherwise. Um, okay, so moving, moving on, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to import the, um, the information. I do want you to know that, uh, let's see here, one of the, one of the things I want to do is I'm going to set up, this is part of the training I want you to under, understand. We can also set up what's called a root a client folder um, for each, uh, a root folder for each client. So you can navigate back and forth between the windows that are open. Actually, this tool is it's got multiple windows, you know, and you could click through the windows like this. I recommend always working in full screen and just navigating from one window to the other using the Windows drop-down. Um, so on the client details, there's this process management tab, which would keep track of, I mean, you can generate a service agreement from here. Um, so it starts with the sales cycle and it ends with invoicing. Actually, it ends with sending an engagement ending letter. So you, we have form letters that you can um, 
that you can uh, uh, create with a click of a button. They're all customizable as Word templates. Um, and once you change the template, then you're going to get that capability for all of your uh, clients. You can also have a different savings percentage for landlines versus cellular. So if you want to bill somebody, you know, 40% for cellular and 50% for landline, that, that capability exists. You notice we also have an hourly rate. So if you want to bill for project services, you can journal your time and, um, and bill hourly for a, uh, for a client. But um, again, we, I want to stay on track with the cellular because that I think will be, uh, you know, it's, it's primary purpose is a, um, is a uh, um, optimization, contingency cost savings, even though it can be used for lots of other business models too. So what we do is when we set a default root folder for a client like I just did here, then when I go to import data for this client, whether it be inventory or usage, it's going to start me off in that root folder. Um, let's see here. Apparently, I didn't put the right folder in. Excuse me a second. Client details. Cellular client. Yeah, I got it right there. Okay, save. Okay. So on the um, client de device details, when I go to import, there it is. I must not have saved my, my changes. So um, it's going to take me to this root folder, so I don't have to navigate all over my network to try to find this client information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this account, and I'm going to import the Melbourne telephone numbers that uh, my script extracted. So notice, I, and that could be 80, 800, whatever, it doesn't matter. So we now have three of those bubbles. I got clients, I have a location, and I have, um, have, uh, and, and I have line, line, you know, line information. But all I have are phone numbers and usernames, and um, but I also have this information about the uh, the the plans that are on. Now, if there's other plans like Global Data or whatever, they're going to show up on here as well. Now, if I the next thing I need to have is a supplier for the Verizon Wireless. Now, again, it's as simple as going to a supplier section of TAMS under the suppliers and clicking New. Uh, I didn't want to waste your time showing you how to type in plan information. So I already have Verizon Wireless in here. And I created some plans that I use an acronym for my clients, uh, for each of my clients. So this one's New Cellular Client, NCC. So I already have some plans predefined, but I'll walk you through. If I need to add a plan, I just click, come in here and I click Add Plan. So it's just like the other forms. And I give it a plan name. Now, uh, for the US uh, consultants, I recommend strongly that you keep your plans uh, separated uh, um, within your client boundary. So don't reuse a plan from one client to the next. Um, even though reusability is a wonderful thing, um, it can really uh, bite you if you have it highly you know, integrated across all your clients and then you come in and edit something on one plan, you just affected all of your clients that reuse that plan. So I find using plans on client boundaries, particularly because of local and state taxes and 911 fees that vary so greatly here in the states. For the Canadian folks, not so much because you have really, um, uh, you have very um, uh, simple taxes and so you may get a lot more reuse. So once a plan is defined, you know, and you can give it a title and then select a service type, um, then you will see that there are some common elements to the plans, like a monthly recurring cost and some tax rates and some local fees that can be used for 911 and whatnot. And then there's the specific parameters of what type of service it is. So for cell data, there's some parameters. Um, for cellular, for voice, there's some parameters about peak, minutes, allowances, shared, free inbound, whatever. Um, there's um, messaging parameters. So you get these different details. So once um, you fill in, that's is really where the brain trust and the manual element of the tool is, is to be able to populate these plans. Now, once you have a plan, however, so for example, if I clear this, and I have plans in here for all kinds of corporate companies, I can take a plan that is set up for one client, and I can clone it with this little clone button, 
and it makes a copy of it, and now I can take that plan and say, okay, that's for YYY company, you know, for a different company, and maybe it's in a different state or something like that, like California. Maybe they have different taxes for those things. Maybe they don't, and I can click Save. So once you have a plan, you can clone it as many times as you want to. The only condition is that um, you cannot duplicate the plan name, and you wouldn't want to because when you're looking at a list of plan names, if you had three of them or five of them that all had the same name, you wouldn't be able to discriminate one from the other. So it does, uh, by design, want a unique uh, plan name. Okay? Um, so uh, the uh, plans that I set up for this client, I just want to show um, that I can filter by, and that's another benefit of having an acronym that you use for each plan name, is that it allows you to filter through all of these different plans and just narrow it down to the handful that you need for this particular client. So this particular uh, account is pretty simple. It's on a share everything. It has a, 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 a voice component. One of the things I'm going to recommend is that um, you take um, anything that's a bundled plan, and rather than putting all of the cost on one service, that you distribute the cost to each service in, in I'll just say, a reasonable fashion. And, and the reason is is because later there are analytic reports that will identify um, devices that have inefficient uh, plans that are not good value and they percolate to the top of the reports. And if you have a plan like, let's say, the Share Talk Everything, where for a smartphone for $40, you get unlimited talk, unlimited text, and then you get to share in a, an allowance of data, then you would not necessarily want to put all $40 on the talk component, the, the talk service. Um, instead, we put 20 on the talk and 10 on the messaging and, and 10 on the data. And, and the reason is, um, because if you see um, zero dollars on the messaging and um, lots of, of usage, then you think, oh, that's really great value. And if you um, uh, have all forty dollars on that messaging instead of on the voice, uh, then you might not think that's really good value at all. So the value equation is going to uh, be dependent between the cost for that service and the um, usage of that service. And so um, by distributing these costs, um, it will help with uh, understanding whether they're getting good value or not. Certainly, a $20 unlimited data plan is not very good if you only have one or two text messages a month. Um, and it's a great value if you have two or 3,000 or, like my daughter, 8,000 messages a month. So. Okay, so we, we have a talk plan where it's $20, it's unlimited. Um, we also have a messaging plan, um, and it's unlimited included in this. But again, this is just this particular example. Um, we also have uh, international messaging, so and that can be uh, for North Americans. So I know for the Canadians, there are um, some plans that allow for messaging between U.S. and Canada in a bundle. And then there are others that uh, where you have a separate uh, rates or allowances be, uh, between the U.S. and other countries. So this is when you're roaming or texting outside of your country. Um, and you notice it can be to foreign destinations or in foreign destinations. Again, uh, we have help files that, that describe these details of the individual fields. But in essence, you have a whole group of combinations of specifying allowances, what your overage rates are, and whether things are billed on a pay-per-use or included in the allowance or not. Um, th we have data um, international. There's four zones um, for data for international roaming. In this case, it's a pay-per-use. So if it's a U.S. phone roaming up in Canada uh, on this Verizon, it's 0.02 per kilobyte. Um, in Mexico, it's 0.005, and then zones three and four, which is the rest of the world, it's point, uh, two cents per kilobyte. But we have, you can put allowances in and, uh, uh, and overage rates as well. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail on these plans. One thing I do need to point out on the international, and this is true for landline or cellular, um, is that we have an international plan. It may or may not have a monthly recurring charge. The standard one does not. 
Um, it has some taxes associated with it. We actually also have the, a, a lot of fidelity in taxes where you can come in and check with this tax map and say, well, these taxes apply to monthly fees or local fees or different types of roaming. So by checking the boxes, you can really zero in on uh, the, the, the tax elements of these services. Um, but there's, as you all know, there are different rates to different countries. So we also have this thing called an international rate table. Now, again, you could populate this manually and say that the calls from the U.S. to Germany, you know, is going to be, um, you know, 20 cents per minute or something to that effect and add that into the rate table. Or you can let TAMs pre-populate it for you during the import of international uh, calls. So that's the m more automated way of doing it, and that is let TAMs do the work just by virtue of importing usage. So we don't need to necessarily populate this table um, at the beginning, but what we do need to have is a blank table that is set up and attached to the plan so that it um, has a placeholder so that whenever the rates come in, it knows which table to populate. Because we have, you know, we have uh, all types of, of international rate tables for different clients um, that have value plans or global plans or whatever. So, uh, and of course, that would be on a, each provider is going to have their own rate table. So it can be from, let's say in this case, U.S. to Germany, that's outbound long distance, or it could be from Germany to the U.S. or Canada. Of course, I don't mean to be too biased to the U.S. here, um, but that could be $1.99 a minute at the standard rate for roaming. So we have the originating and terminating, and any combination of countries is, is available. So, um, but you don't have to manually populate all of these, uh, these rates. Okay, so let me uh, close that um, and, um, and uh, finish off with uh, two other types of plans, of course, the uh, cell data. When we have shared data plans, we um, have a plan that uh, we've apportioned $10 of the cost of a smartphone to uh, the data component. Um, it turns out also by separating the cost across different services, you'll find that um, the taxing the taxes also tend to line up. This is exactly what some of the carriers do, like Verizon. If you use $20 for voice, $10 for messaging, and, and $10 for data, with no taxes on the data component, uh, this probably sounds crazy to the Canadian consultants, but here in the States, certain services are taxed and other services are not. Well, we found that if you do a 20-10-10 split between voice messaging and data, that um, you and put zero taxes on your, on your data and zero federal taxes on your messaging and put your regular state taxes on the voice and messaging, that they'll match the bill. <laughs> so um, there's... Um, uh, a, a secondary benefit besides the value equation uh, during the analysis of put, splitting those costs, you also get to kind of mirror what, how they tax. Now, in this case, we have a phone that shares data for 20 gig uh, uh, allowance, and um, it will share with any other phone that's in the same share, share pool or sub-account in, 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 in TAMs, you know, TAMZs or whatever it is. Um, we also have secondary phones that don't add any allowance, but they share. So here's a device that has, it shares, but it does not contribute to the pool, okay? Um, and we can model these primary and secondary uh, types of, of sharing arrangements. We can also model stackable sharing arrangements. So that might be somebody, everybody brings 200 minutes to the voice pool, or some people bring 400 minutes and others bring 900 minutes or whatever. So depending on the pricing parameters and the allowance and the share mark, or they can be standalone. They don't have to share with others. So they can have their own dedicated allowance. Um, but it's just a matter of clicking the right boxes and if, you, if it doesn't share, you would put in what the overage rate is. So they're very, uh, these forms, once you've become accustomed to them, are very simple and um, clonable, of, of course. So let's um, go off of here and quickly uh, review where, uh, what we have now. 
So we have a client, we have a location, we've imported our inventory, we have a supplier, and we have a selection of plans. Now all we need is an account and a sub-account, we can go to the managed services. So I'm going to close out of these forms. Every time you close, it takes you back to the previous form that you were on. Um, and actually, the um, accounts are always entered at the client level, and that's because a single account can span multiple locations, um, and uh, you can have devices from different locations all billing on the same account. Um, and of course, a location can have multiple accounts associated with it. It might have a, a, land, a local service account, a long distance account, a data account you know, for MPLS or whatever. Notice that there are two types of accounts. There's service accounts are for voice and data, and then cellular are separate. So don't confuse those. When we're going to add a cellular account, again, we just come to the cellular account form, click Add Account. Here's where, um, again, the amount of information that's necessary is minimal, but uh, you have lots of information that you can put in here um, and ways of managing these. Um, I'm going to come down here and say this is a Verizon Wireless account. If I don't have Verizon Wireless, I could just click here and add a new supplier immediately, and it would take me to that add new supplier, and I type in a name and click save. So it's very simple to add a new supplier. But I'm going to put in an account number um, because I, I, I know that there are um, uh, more than one account with this client, and um, I think it's eight phones or something like that. I could say it's a share everything pool, whatever I want in my description. But I'm going to click Save. That's all that's actually required is the first two fields. And it creates an account. And by default, just like a location got created when we added a client, it adds the sub-account. So we now have that extra bubble, that, that circle that we needed, to, that we were shooting for. But let me show you what the uh, share pool is, is all about. Because for cellular, it is um, pretty meaningful. Actually, it's meaningful for both. But, very meaningful for cellular. Sometimes it's meaningful for landlines. Um, and so uh, let's see here. Got to open up. I want to open up that invoice. So in this invoice, we have a total cost, and um, we have these account charges and credits. And it's a share pool of 20 gig with a 22% discount that charges $117. Notice that's an account level charge. It's not tied to any single phone number. So what we can do here is on our sub-accounts, we actually have what are called billable parameters. And we can put that $117 for the pool on the sub-account. So it's not tied to any single phone. It mirrors what they do. Now, AT&T does it differently. They put the primary cost on a primary and we can do the same thing with TAMs. We want to try to model exactly what the carriers have so that what you look at in TAMs and what you see on their bills match each other. There may be a few exceptions where it, you know, some carriers do some, some odd or peculiar things. But for the most part, we can match their, um, their, their billing. You know, what you see in TAMs and what you see on a bill are going to be the same. So uh, we know that they are getting a 22% discount on this client. Turns out there's no taxes on the $117. Again, that may vary from state to state. Um, but I can edit these parameters by clicking on this record and clicking Save. Now I've got, and when I click on a record, it activates these, these fields, and they're all editable. You can always edit whatever you put in. So if you, miss, if you don't know the answer to begin with, it doesn't mean you can't put it in and go back later and, and refine it. OK. So, we now have a sub-account with a, 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 a parameter in there uh, with a monthly fee and the discount level and what the overs rate is. So we now have all of the prerequisites in order to do that managed services. So, you know, again, um, we have a client, a location, some lines, an account with a sub-account and supplier and plans. So we're going to now come to this managed line services. And by the way, the help file is also uh, hyper hypertext to, you know, to other sections of health. So you can click on it, it'll navigate you to those sections. Um, so let me just jump right to that form. There's about three or four different ways of, of there's lots of ways of navigating the tool. But um, 
the uh, so so just because you can get to a particular form from four or five different locations, uh, you know, directions, it's still the same form. So don't be confused thinking there's a hundred forms here. There's really only about six or seven. It's, it's like bagpipes, you know, you, you know, seven notes, but they can make a lot of noise. Um, so uh, what I have here is a um, the ability to select. Um, all locations, if I wanted to apply devices uh, to a particular account, um, it, it, irrespective of its current location, or I can um, narrow what I'm working on through filtering to a single location. Of course, I imported all of these phones to the same location. Um, I. Uh, I'm always going to start with adding a baseline. You have to have a baseline before you can optimize it. Um, so this form you should work from the top to the bottom, left to right, and it looks the same for landlines as it does for uh, for um, cellular. I can use this slider bar to um, to you know organize the layout um, that, that's useful to me. I can also um, bring in uh, information about uh, these devices and because the information is, is useful m more so than the username is I, honestly since I already know the the plans on here I don't need to bring in this uh, other information but I'm going to show you anyway um, just because it allows me to demonstrate um, by right clicking on many forms you're going to get what we call hot links or other options um, a field chooser is a very common uh, capability uh, to bring into these grids that kind of look like uh, Excel spreadsheets, but they're uh, much more uh, capable. Um, notice I don't have information from the in invoice called the device type or what the contract end date is. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over and import. I navigated by right-clicking and saying view device details. And now I can import some other device records. And rather than bringing in more devices, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in some information about these devices, and I can uh, update existing records if I want to. And so it is going to bring in information about this is from the script of the uh, device report that provided me like what the make and model of the phone is, the IMEI, the contract end dates. And um, notice we have this field called device type. Um, it's not a field that uh, Verizon provides to us. But I want you to see um, how I can do a, a block edit on, um, on these records. So I opened up my field chooser and dragged in a couple more fields by dropping them into this grid. And I can sort by clicking on a record. I can sort in ascending or descending order. I can hold the shift button down, and this is all in documented to help. And I can sort a second level by um, by doing um, a second click on another column and see what type of phone they are. Now these are all iPhones, so they're all going to be smartphones. And I can click on this, and and uh, actually I noticed that this was a smartphone on six one one nine also. Um, so I can select a block of records, or I can cherry pick them with a, the control button. I can turn them off or on individually. And now I can type into this field and say, hey, these are smartphones. And the reason I'm doing this is because it makes a difference on, in the billing as to whether they get billed as a smartphone or as a, uh, as a tablet or a basic phone or whatever. So um, this is also a smartphone. I'm going to uh, include it as a smartphone. Um, and then this is a basic phone, a Casio GZ G Zone or whatever, then I'll just call it a basic phone. So by I can do block edits and edit a whole bunch of things at once. I don't have to work them one at a time. OK, so back to the managed services form. I'm going to refresh this form. Um, we used to automatically refresh it, but we had some folks said, hey, I had everything set up the way I wanted to, and then you refreshed it, and, and I lost my, my work. Oops, excuse me, managed service. What I want to do is the field chooser. And now I can bring in things like the device type and see what's a smartphone, what's a basic phone. Obviously, the, co the comments from the plan names would have told me the same thing. But um, again, I'm demonstrating you know, some of the capabilities here. So what I want to do now is I want to say which plans are billing on these phones on this account. And, and that brings me to this uh, component of our overview 
called this uh, Trinity relationship that says these plans are on these phones on this account, or more specifically on this sub-account. So it's the three white circles that I'm going to create a relationship with. Um, and I can do them very quickly and easily. I have my account selected. I am going to start my baseline back in April or February of this year, which is nine months prior to today. I think the default is six months. You can go back as far as you want. You can go back five years if you want. Normally, we put in three months of, hist of historical data. And again, I'm going to use the capability of these grids to sort by device type. And um, I'm going to... Um, uh, select all of my smartphones, and I'm going to put uh, check boxes in each of the ones that I have highlighted blue. And it says I'm going to operate on these, and over here on the right I'm going to actually filter my plans down to the set of plans that I have designated for this client. And these all get the uh, talk for $20, the messaging for $10, there's a pay-as-you-go international messaging, and I put these on here by default just in case someone happens to travel for a vacation and they, and they send a few text messages. I'll be able to import that usage. You cannot import usage in TAMS to a device on a service unless the, that service has a plan, you know, the, that plan exists on that phone for that billing date. So we're um, kind of priming the pump here so that if we ever see international long distance or roaming voice calling, even though these don't have any monthly recurring costs, we're going to include them onto our phones. Now, I would not put a voice plan or a, uh, a messaging, um, well, let's say a voice plan, on a tablet. So that's why knowing the device type is useful. And I'm going to designate all of these as secondary smartphones, except one of them. I need to, um, I need to, uh, uh, allow for some um, primary. Somebody has to bring uh, the allowance to the pool. So I'll just um, uh, pick um, one of these users. I don't know this guy here. I'll uncheck this one phone. And then uh, all of these others are going to get um, act as secondaries and have these other uses. So once I've clicked these plans to go into these phones, I just click this Create Baseline, and it adds 36 history records uh, uh, in total. So that's six times six, six lines at six uh, plans get added to these phones. And I'll show you what we just did here in a second. But I want to finish this. I can clear these. And now this other smartphone, I'm going to make it a primary. Notice it's still only $10 because it doesn't get charged any extra. Um, because the charge for the pool is on the sub account, but I do need to designate that somebody that there's 20 gigabit of allowance. Now we're talking about an enhancement where we can just put the allowance down on the sub account as well. But for now, um, you just designate a primary as having 20 gig allowance, and we add that baseline. Now we still have a basic phone. And that's a secondary share. It doesn't get charged for data, but its access fee is, uh, notice it says $30 right here. So there's 20 and 10, and all these others are zeros. So that $30 for a basic phone line access into the share pool gets added. So if we go look at these line details, we now have this history, and it shows every service of every line. It shows the date that we added them. It shows what the plan is what the supplier is, what the account is that it bills on. And it does that for every service. So we've put, uh, we've told TAMS, that here are the set of plans on these sets of phones that bill on this account. So what can we do with that? Well, now we can go to the account and we can actually start importing usage and doing our analysis. So first we want to make sure that we have everything set up right. And the way we do that is we on the cellular account details, we have a tab called Account Invoice Data. And uh, by the way, um, if you want to, you can put the access info for your login ID, you know, whatever it is, um, and your password, so that when you click on this URL to go to Verizon's website to download their bills each month, you, you can click on it and it takes you right to it, and then you can copy and paste your username and password, which, you know, when you have hundreds of accounts to manage, uh, it's always at your fingertips right when you need it, where you need it. 
Um, we also have the ability to create emails automatically by clicking on a link, and it will open up your email with your signature, put in the client information and account number, and then you can start composing your email. Um, so that is um, a, a capability as well for making composing emails. Um, well, my Outlook just crashed. Who knows why? It's fine. Okay, so um, so here is uh, what we call the billing of the account invoice data tab, and what we need to do is we want to import the usage for this month, and we should be able to identify that the costs are four hundred seventy-five dollars and ninety-six cents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in that billing cycle, which is uh, seven twenty-eight twenty fourteen. So I'm going to say seven on seven twenty-eight twenty fourteen. We have a bill that's four hundred and seventy-five dollars and ninety-six cents, and I'm going to say add or update this billing cycle since it doesn't exist. I'm adding it. It already knows which phones are on this account, um, and it does it for every uh, service type. This is your voice services. Actually, voice services re require two tabs because you can have um, uh, directory assistance. Uh, this is domestic roaming and domestic long distance, which we don't have here in the state so much, but there is that up in Canada. Um, there's the, your domestic messaging, inbound and outbound, text, picture, and video. There's international messaging, your data, domestic, international uh, data, international voice. Ancillary services, which I did not speak about at, when I was looking at the plans. Um, Ancillary services are a catch-all type of plan that could be anything you want it to be. So it can be a flat monthly fee, like handset insurance. It could be a metered fee with usage. It could be shared usage. It can have an allowance. It's like the quantum state of any uh, other feature. Um, this is most commonly used now for things like um, handset insurance. You know, uh, we've got most of the other uh, data fields covered in these other services. And then there's this grid here at the end that is where we kind of put together all of this information. So when we first open up a billing cycle, there's no usage in here, and we have to import that usage. Again, you saw me run the script. It can just extract the usage in a matter of seconds for a given billing cycle, and we can import that usage data, and we can see all of the usage of each of these devices. So. Um, what we need to uh, then do, and you can see the data usage or whatnot, and now we can come back to this billing cycle cost and say, could you please put this uh, you know, whole thing together for me and tell me how we look compared to the bill? And so you can change this view. Again, I wanted you to be aware that these um, um, the grids are quite powerful. Uh, you can group and sort by just dragging headers up and down and dropping them. Um, there's a field chooser with lots of other fields, but if I want to group them by service type, I can see that um, to look at my, my data usage and see uh, by clicking a header, I can sort so I can see you know, what my total allowance is, what my um, usage is on a per device basis. I can look at um, the group as a whole, um, and the, they're very, very interactive um, grids. Uh, the default view that I start off with is I want to make sure that my cost of the bill is that I'm coming up with in TAMS m matches to a certain, let's say, accuracy of the um, supplier invoice. So the supplier was 475.96. TAMS is taking all the plans, all the taxes, all the usage, and coming up with a calculated cost. And then it's comparing on an individual phone-by-phone -phone basis because our script pulls out the total cost of each phone, this build MTN is what it came from the supplier invoice, we can see that we're within uh, the cost differential here is six cents on each of these devices, even the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the basic phone. So, um, and then down here at the bottom, we can see what our cumulative usage is, is only three gig out of a 20 gig of allowance. So this gives me one month of, of usage in order to um, to uh, r reconcile this bill to within 1% accuracy, that's why it's green. You can set your own thresholds, by the way, um, as to when to turn yellow or red. Uh, but um, there are a lot of details that you can uh, you know 
extract from um, the from this you know process of reconciling the bill. Now that gets us through the um, the partial baselining, and I say partial because I always like to have three months of data imported. Once you have one month done, the second month is is in, if there's no changes to the account, then there's no history that needs to be changed, which means that all you need to do is have the usage for the next month, which is running a script, uh, opening the PDF to know what the uh, the grand total is because you need to match to it. And the next month, the grand total is four twenty five eighty nine dollars for the current charges, but notice there were some adjustments here. And those adjustments came in after the last bill, so we really, if we want to bring in these adjustments and, and understand what they are, because they, they could be a credit that we want to bill for, we maybe called up last month and said, hey, you know, there's an error and we got a credit issue. Maybe we want that $16.74 or $1,600 credit. We want to include that and bill for that uh, credit. So what we're going to do is we're going to reconcile this 40915 and include the 1674 in adjustments. So this is more not so much a tool but a, an accounting principle for reconciling a, a monthly invoice. So I can put in um, 828. 40915, say add update billing cycle because it has a new date. It's a different billing cycle. And I can import my usage. And I'm going to double click the import usage. And what I got was um, a couple of warnings. And I'm doing this so that you see the real world uh, scenario that, that is sometimes to be dealt with. And that is that there's another phone number that it says does not exist on this account. So if you are importing usage and a new phone number has been added to the account without your prior knowledge, then it's going to flag that exception to you so that you know that, hey, my records are not in sync with the carrier records. That's a very useful needle to uh, identify so quickly. So um, what I can do is I can go and take a look at what that um, 6035 phone number is and I can see that there's an adjustment in here for that telephone number um, that was a $15. They changed the phone number. And if I look down through the bill, I can see that 6035 on, on this particular phone number here under Kevin Kelly. And um, I can go and investigate, well, what phone number did that used to be? Who changed the phone number? And uh, make the adjustment within TAMS accordingly. So um, what it did do for me, however, is it brought in the new usage. It um, obviously could not bring in usage for a phone number that it doesn't have in its database. So I would either need to go change a phone number or add a phone number um, and add the baseline plans to it on the date that it was added. Um, and then I could uh, calculate my costs and, and reconcile. But notice this one phone number is, is off by um, by a cost differential of $47. So um, clearly, once I resolve that one phone, then my grand total on my account is going to also match. But I want you to see that not only did we import usage, but we imported one-time charges or prorated charges. So it's able to handle things like equipment purchases, late fees, um, you know, anything that a partial month charge when a phone gets added. Um, so those make reconciling these bills uh, m much better. Now, I don't have the time to go into uh, what the analysis and optimization is, but this clearly is, is a starting point. I do want to show you um, some things from this client that uh, is, I, I have as a demo, um, some things that kind of the end result, so you kind of see the end game of why we go through this process. First of all, it establishes your billing baseline. And TAMS will use these plans and configurations of sharing um, and cost points of the subaccounts to compare to once you put in optimizations. And um, what uh, what I'm going to do? Give me one second here. Please ignore the man behind the the mirror or behind the curtain. Um, okay. So here's a recommendation letter that um, 
has uh, this account with a 20 gig allowance. Let me zoom in on it a little bit more here. So you can see, and these reports all come from TAMS. The, the TAR comes from TAMS. There's a little bit of a manual uh, collation, and, and there is a customization capabilities with the TAR. But this was a, uh, one of these sub-accounts where there was a 20 gig allowance, and it was only using you know three to four gig. So clearly, you know, there's cost savings opportunities there. Um, there was also uh, there's a report here where you can come in and and say identify for me. Um, after I've imported three or four months or whatever you want, show me all the devices with no usage. And this particular account, um, uh, let me see here, new cellular client. I only have two months in there right now, um, but I can say, please show me uh, the devices that are still active that have not had any usage in the last three months or four months or of all of the months that I've imported. And in this particular uh, case, there was one of the phones that was um, this particular phone that was the basic phone. It also had no uh, usage on it. So right there, um, we were able to take out a device with no usage and address, address the uh, pool size. Of course, we ended up re rearranging all of their pools and uh, on this particular client, even though they were already getting a 22% discount, and they were already in uh, what are considered to be the more cost-effective like data sharing pools, um, we were able to uh, reduce their cost by 24% or uh, $27,000 a year. And this client, I took from zero data in TAMS to having this TAR done in one day. So, um, and I believe they had about nine accounts uh, total. But I just went through in an hour the baselining of one of those nine accounts, uh, giving the training, of course. And um, like I said, so once you're proficient at and familiar with these, uh, and once the plans are set up, you get all that reuse across the same client, or you can even share them across clients, but cloning is so easy. Like I said, I don't recommend that. Um, so the uh, we, we import this information so that then we can run the analysis. And that's where I would uh, kind of want to stop at this point so that um, you can see where we're going with it and uh, um, without giving you too much to, to bite off and chew on so that you can uh, experience the, the baselining components. Um, again, some of the forms, like the client details form, I only touched once. The client location, I really only touched once. I imported the client, uh, the phone numbers into the into the cell phone details. I was there a couple of times. Um, the supplier plans is where you know the bulk of the time is spent. The supplier details you set up the, the supplier once, um, but then coming in and importing the data um, and for each month and reconciling it is is one area. And of course, the managed services where you're saying which plans are billing on which lines on which account. Um, is is the other area that's uh, more interactive. So um, once you do the the first one is going to be very confusing. The second one not so much, and by the third or fourth one it's going to be old hat. Okay, so it's like twelve thirty five. I've been going for an hour, um, and I I believe I covered off on uh, most of the things. Let me just review the syllabus real quick. We talked about um, the Explorer bar some quick links when you right click on things you can navigate uh, all over the place uh, adding new items is real simple um, you, being able to uh, just edit anything that you want and then saving so if I need to change a parameter um, I can just come in click on it and if I made a typo there I click this number click save so that is um, the uh, common you know always look for the save over on the left hand side here uh, the um, grid behavior about grouping and sorting um, and using the field chooser to rearrange which columns you have and what order they're in. Of course, these grids are copyable to uh, Excel. You can print them in many cases. Um, so multiple selection, doing block selects. Again, th this is all in help. Uh, the Windows Help menu is helpful, uh, using the Windows menu to navigate, jump between forms that you already have open. And then when it comes to baselining a client, we talked about adding a client, adding a location, adding a supplier uh, account, um, with uh, 
setting up online access so you can click and go right to their website, about share pools and sub accounts, adding the mobile line inventory, running a script, which you can't do until you're licensed, but we can run those for you for importing, um, importing that inventory, adding supplier plans, and then using the managed services to put it all together, adding a billing cycle importing usage. Um, of course, the scripting is used to extract that usage data or one-time charges, and then using the reconciling to get the green so that you um, you uh, are matching the spire invoice and know you have a well calibrated model of your client costs. Okay, so I think I covered everything. So I'll just open it up now and 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 uh, answer questions or or give additional demo whatever you want to go over. I'm we'll leave free. Hey, Chris, this is Dan. Um, Paul and I are licensed, but one question I have for you is I tried to start running those uh, device report, and what I found is I'm frequently going back and forth between my computer and the hosted environment, and I can't develop a shortcut, and I'm just trying to find out if I'm going back and forth between these um, for example, the scripts or these PDFs of the bills, is there a way to create a shortcut instead of, I've counted like 22 folder structures I need to go through to move back and forth and upload it to the TAMS? Okay, so in the hosted environment, um, that's a great question. There is, I was going to try to open up my Citrix receiver here and, and, and show that to you because uh, this was, uh, I was showing TAMS and not the, the some of the, the components of the hosted environment. If you just give me one second here, um, I have my Citrix receiver, and uh, I'll open up the File Explorer. Uh, when you open TAMS from the hosted environment, it looks just like it's running locally, so you, you don't even know whether you're running TAMS locally or not. But there is a difference with the File Explorer, and that difference is that you, first of all, must open the File Explorer from the Citrix environment, whether you go in through the um, uh, Windows Explorer or, or you know Chrome or whatever the the browser interface or from this uh, receiver applic uh, client application interface when you open up the file Explorer from from one of those two locations then what you'll get is um, uh, a uh, Explorer window but notice that it has this uh, thing here called local disk C on your local machine. So these are my local machine um, folders. And uh, up here, uh, let me, really what I should do is open up another one, because uh, I have so many mappings that the very first uh, mapping does not uh, show you all of the fields. So, so I could come in, I have an admin permission so that I can help you know administer this. But in your case, I could, well, let me just take it. I won't go into that one. I could come in and have my list of clients here, and I can have uh, you know my scripts. Like you, somebody was asking about the shortcuts. Of course, when you're in the hosted environment, they're all right here, and all you do to run them is is you double click on them. Um, so when you double click on it, it pops open the little the little window, you know, to put in the input and output, you know, uh, files. But for for you, um, Dan, what I have found is that if I go to my local drive and then I start drilling down into my subfolders, it takes a while for it to um, kind of instantiate those um, folders to the Citrix client and then convey it to you visually on the display. So what I have set up is a temp folder, and any time I want to transfer something from my local computer to the server, then I throw it into the temp folder, and, uh, and then I just copy it from here, and I'll stick it over like into my client folder or whatever it is, like if I'm bringing up a, but I don't even, I no longer install anything to my local computer. I do it all from the server, because when I come from TAMS, if I go to a service account, and I click on this link here to open up Verizon Wireless, and it takes me and I log in and I get a PDF or a, you know, a CSR or a device report or whatever, when I save it, I save it straight into my client folder up on the server, and then it's available to whoever needs it, right? Everybody on my team has access to it. So um, I don't do a lot of transferring between local and server. There's really no need to. But if you do need to, open up the browser from you know, the, the Citrix client, 
and then you can get to your local machine. But I use this top level folder rather than trying to drill down uh, to you know ten layers down on my local machine. That's just a waste of my time. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. What else? Uh, there's got to be some questions. Well, it's uh, Ron here. Just a, uh, just wondering. You said you're recording this. Are we going to get access to the recording? Yeah, I'll put it up on. We have a YouTube channel, and I'll uh, stick it up there. And then uh, you, it's it's not a a published one, so I have to send out the the private URL to it. Any, any chance you can just email me the email me the the copy? Yeah. Oh, the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know. This thing's probably going to be like a hundred and some meg, so I don't know if the the email attachment would be great. I think you'd be better off just seeing it on YouTube. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Chris, this is Paul. Um, so I'm just thinking, um, I, was, I guess following you throughout the process, I'm wondering, I haven't looked in detail on the help files. Do, do like the help files, do they take like a step-by-step -step approach? Like first, do, you know, step number one, step number two, step number right. three? Yep. Yeah. So, so on the getting started, um, okay, let's see, uh, under, let's see, is it welcome, overview, here, on the overview. So we talk about these general concepts about the three-way relationship that we create between the plans, the lines they bill on, and the accounts, you know, that they bill on. And, um, and also about this thing called the living baseline. You've only seen um, on this demo setting up the baseline. Ch change history is, is even simpler uh, in some ways. Uh, but knowing what to change is where the analytics comes in, and that's where it, it just takes brain power and experience probably to know what are the plans that the providers have and um, using the reporting capabilities of, of the tool to sift through and identify those pressure points and then you know, implement the, those alternatives. But um, you know, the, the reports and all of the tool are definitely um, Useful, but there's no there's no easy button. It doesn't there's no substitute for for you know for a smart hardworking person you know. Right. Uh, but that's um, but anyway, at the bottom here is this uh, in this okay. overview is what we call the management life cycle, and it's it's a high level you know uh, like start with a service agreement with a client, and you can click on these links to go to the different sections of help. Um, but it's a procedural thing that takes you through. Um, how to manage, and you can replace lines with cell phones or whatever, depending on whether you're working on the landline side or the cellular side. But um, it does take you down to generating a tar and then invoicing, you know, and even sending a thank you letter at the end of, or you know, um, request for testimonials as you get to the end of your uh, engagement or whenever you decide to do it. But obviously, within each of these um, uh, tasks, like the managed line services, that can be very simple, like I did. I did a full account in a, a few minutes, um, or it could be very, very complicated. If it's an AT and T account that spans 30 locations with 22 sub accounts, you know that one account is going to take a lot more time. So, um, but realize, as you probably all know, this is not always a linear process from start to finish. Sometimes you get new accounts um, along the way that you weren't aware of earlier. You find some long distance, but you don't have a local bill for those same phone numbers. Um, you um, you know take on new services. You did your cellular, and now you're going to do their landline. Um, maybe you don't have online access yet, but you have a paper bill, and you can start by putting in the stubbing in, so to speak, the account information. Uh, before you have all of the usage information available to you. So um, even though it would be wonderful if we had all of our dominoes lined up and we could just run from 1 to 13, you are not required to uh, you know, finish one step before you start another step. So it's designed to allow for more you know, interaction and putting in some basic information and then coming back and refining it later if necessary. But this is kind of the high level process that takes you from start to finish. Uh, and then by clicking on each of these, you can go into further and further detail because the help uh, can, can get very, very detailed about setting, establishing a baseline 
and then applying optimizations. And it turns out optimizing is the same as a baselining with the exception of you already have services that exist and then you're changing those services. So you start with the same form and you click on optimize. Of course, we're going to optimize it probably more like today or even better someday in the future. And we're going to select what we're changing. Um, so we might be changing, for example, the simplest might be to uh, take this phone that's on a 20 gig and change it to a um, I'm going to I'll show you how quick I can do this. I can clone this plan, make it a 6 gig plan. 6 gig, change the name, change the allowance, save it. Apply that 6 gig plan as a 24 month billable optimization. I'll keep it on the same account. And I need to also change that when I do that, my sub account is going to go from um, $117 it's going to drop, and I'm going to also future date this, and it's going to become I don't know what it is uh, with the discount. It's like I it's like thirty dollars and or thirty two eighty or something like that. I don't remember the exact amount, but um, whatever it is, twenty two percent save. Boom! I just put in an optimization which would allow me to compare uh, the savings on this new cell client. Hey, on 1-1-2015, can you tell me how much? And of course, I could do a, a removal. That's something else that when we get into um, showing the optimization. But I can see that I'm going to save them $84, 17.2%. And I can look at these this information from a optimized perspective, um, or I can look at it where it says I have a six gig allowance with 3.8 gig of usage, or I can look at it from a baseline perspective, and I can come in and say, oh, they had 20 gig allowance for $117 with only 3.8 gig of usage. So I can also do a remove service. I do want to mention that, uh, even though it's kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit into the future. Notice there's a, a, a remove service is a lot like an optimization, but um, we're not um, optimizing it, we're removing it. And now we can bill for removals or we can just say, oh, they canceled this phone and I can put that as a zero duration and then it will not be a billable service removal, it will just be a, a regular service removal. But if I decide that this phone is uh, has no usage and is not needed, I can remove the service but the way we remove a service is we put these uh, special plans that are pre-built in TAMS into a supplier called deleted services. So there's a supplier that's built into the database called deleted services. It comes pre-populated with all of these plans that are all zero. They don't cost anything. It's like the best supplier in the world because they have no, no cost for anything. So it's just like an optimization except you're putting these zero cost plans on there and it's an accounting principle to allow you to track what got canceled and, and how much are you billing for those things. So the way we handle that is we have to add, like just like on a baseline, we have to have an account to store this information in. So we add this account and we, and we select the deleted services provider and it's, it doesn't really have to have an account number, but it's an accounting of removed lines or, or services. Like you might just cancel handset insurance. You don't have to remove the whole line. So um, I can save that. And it's that simple. I just added an account and a sub-account. Now when I come to my managed services and I want to do a remove service um, on, let's say, this phone, I can check through this block selection, I can check all of those phones, and over here I'm going to say, hey, please remove all of the services on 1-1-2015 and make it billable, and I click remove services. Now that phone will no longer show up in my inventory after 1-1-2015, and I will see, because it's billable, I will see the result of the savings for removing that line 
on this client. So again, on 1-1-2015, it's going to show this, uh, and you can see how quickly this stuff runs, that I can come down and see the savings um, for canceling um, that phone where, uh, let's see, where I have to get all the way down to it. Um, I, this one happens to be grouped by the uh, service type. So this Matt Ryder, see, it, it was billing a, a share everything talk, and now it's a removed cellular. It was share, uh, billing, uh, you know, this messaging. Now it's zero. So uh, of course now I'm down to I'm up to 25.3 percent savings by removing one phone that wasn't being used and correcting the uh, the voice pool or the pool size to match more of its usage. Of course, the final solution we had was a reorganization of the all of the accounts that they had. But I did want you to be aware of this removed, uh, you know, how to remove things and mark them billable. And it doesn't matter which account they come from. They can come from 10 different accounts, but they all go get kept track of under this deleted services mechanism. And Chris, at the same time, if a client makes changes or deletes services, we can also do this and make it non-billable, right? Yes, by putting in a zero billable duration. And of course, if they add a phone, you can add that effective on a new date whenever that phone gets added. And it'll just have a new baseline, but it won't be optimized. And of course, if you uh, realize that their change kind of messed up the mix of things, then you can re-optimize and, and track multiple optimizations, each with their own start and stop time frames. So um, it's very useful for managed services. I will also. Uh, mention that when you're doing managed services, um, we have this ability to create journal entries. So I can add an item, and it might be something like, um, you know, order new phone. You can put the phone number in here, uh, put the amount of time it took you. Then maybe uh, you have to follow up on that for activating. So you know you can put the order number uh, from uh, the carrier MC whatever the number is, um, and uh, uh, you can put the price that it was supposed to be, free shipping or whatever. Of course, when you see the bill, these notes are going to be here so that you can see. Oh, they. We didn't get the price or the free shipping or the uh, waived activation charge, you know, and then um, you m might open a dispute uh, for uh, activation fee. And notice that if, uh, if this takes me a half an hour on the phone, I can change this and it, can, uh, it will automatically total. I can open as many of these as I want on each account, and I can mark them billable. Or individually, I can tick off which ones are billable or unbillable. And that's where your hourly fee could come into play as well. Um, of course, you can mark them as open or closed. And, um, and um, if you have multiple people using, it defaults the date and time and user of uh, those entries. So across all your accounts, of course, there was reports to find out you know, what are my open tasks that I'm tracking, um, how much time did I spend last month on a client, um, what's my billable time? Um, what are my? There's 70 reports here. So, like I said, you're not going to learn this tool in this one one session. But um, the demo uh, t uh, database that comes with TAMS comes pre-populated with a client, and you can use that just to poke around and generate some reports and look at the help files. To and even the help about the reports. There's a section just about uh, the reports and a description of all, all of the reports. It's a long, long web page, but it gives you some sense of all of these um, different graphs and reports that are available. Chris, uh, this is Paul again. Um, oh, go ahead. Hey, Chris, this is uh, George. And now, where, uh, uh, where's the access to the demo? Oh, so in the uh, start menu, uh, let's see here. I maybe have to switch screens. 